We are back after a 15 minute break. Um, I have general services, which is uh, basically facilities and asset management. Um, I have parks and recreation. I have water resources. I have police. I have fire. I think that's it. Um, and then my colleague does most of the planning and the public works. Um, but So I have a lion's share. There's 1,200 employees. I think the, the units that I service uh, support on a regular basis are about 800 of those employees. Um, is that, did I cover all of that? Yes, okay. yes, thank Sorry. you. Um, which of your previous roles do you think relates most closely to the position that we have and why? Sure, actually I would say the last eight years probably apply the most to this position. Um, uh, prior to the city of Asheville, I was in the city of Boulder for six years as the deputy city manager. Um, I, I was, at the time, when I was hired, there was originally two deputy city managers, but the new city manager came in uh, a, my fellow deputy city manager retired and she did not fill that position. Um, so what we did is we pretty much split up. She had police and she had police, um, HR and finance and I had the rest of the organization. So city of, uh, the city of Boulder is a lot like the city of um, Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor and Boulder are I think some of the benchmark communities uh, in, in, the, in the population range but even outside the population range for some of what, uh, the pro progressive things that the communities are doing. Um, Boulder taught me a lot about uh, sustainability, resilience, uh, transportation, multimodal transportation. Uh, they have an incredible network, uh, transportation network, both from a, a, tr a bus a transit system where they have a, city, a community wide eco pass program that neighbors can, neighborhoods can sign up for. They're actually trying to make it community wide and have the county pay for it. Uh, the city offers uh, every aspect of um, alternative transportation to its employees. Um, it also taught me a lot about organizational development. Um, High-performing organizations and communities like um, Ann Arbor and Boulder have a lot of challenges, um, but they're also great to work for. Um, you have the opportunity as an employee and as a member of the public to really take care of the present, but also think to the future and how to make the community the best it can be. It takes a real solid organization to do that. Um, High-performance organizations and communities are tough. It's tough and challenging to work in a community that has such high standards and expectations and desires and a vision. Uh, but it's really, it can be really satisfying and gratifying as a professional. There's real dangers in a high performance organization because there's so much that the community wants to achieve and there's only so much time in a day. Um, and so there are some great things to do from affordable housing perspective, from a transportation perspective, from a sustainability perspective, you name it. There are great things to be done, but there's only so many things a staff can do within the day while also performing the rest of the regular duties. So it's a real challenge to get the vision and the culture aligned so that you get the most out of the organization and you make it an employer of choice. That's a real challenge for high performance organizations. Um, so I find that that experience, plus the engagement, what, what Boulder, Boulder does an excellent job of community engagement and public engagement, employee engagement. In most communities, just like I'm sure Ann Arbor is, uh, the, the council and the organization are a microcosm of the community. 
So what you see in the community, the goods and the bads of it, you will see that within the community and the organization, and you have to respect that and work with that and figure out how to take advantage of it from a perspective of making it work to the best of the ability of the community. Um, because when there's not alignment, that's where it can get a little hinky. Um, so public engagement and community engagement, I, I learned that greatly there in organizational development. I think that uh, there's, a lot, there's a special interest group for everything in a community uh, like Boulder, Ann Arbor, and even Asheville. Um, Asheville's probably about, and I say this respectfully, it's not, a, it's not a criticism at all, but Asheville's probably about 20 years raw behind Boulder. It's probably the Boulder of 20 years ago and of a southern perspective, too. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to do some um, progressive things in the South, but Asheville's really committed to that, has a really committed citizenry, uh, very engaged to a different degree. It's a different type of engagement. There, um, Boulder, you don't have to work hard to get a lot of public engagement. There's an expectation of that. Asheville, it's almost all social media. Um, the, the council tweets and Facebooks and social media is from the dais, um, but also gets a lot of input um, they do a lot of the governance and get a lot of policy ideas and issues through social media. So we have a heavy reliance on social media, and we have to figure out how to get our story out there. It's a real challenge these days. Uh, but so I see a lot of similarities between Asheville and Arbor and uh, Boulder. Why are you interested in coming to Ann Arbor? Um, uh, for a few reasons. First of all, I, uh, the un a university environment really jazzes me. I really get excited by a university uh, community. It can be really challenging, as I'm sure you know. The red solo cup zone up against the really wealthy um, residents, it can be really challenging. The property maintenance issues can be very challenging. The attitude that a, a university can take because you're typically exempt um, from state statute or local code, that can be really challenging. Um, the fact that they take uh, property off the tax records, that can be challenging. But there's also some great benefits to it. Most communities are blessed to have a university of this size in a community because it creates a vibrancy, an incredible vibrancy that makes people want to come here, stay here, and make a difference. Um, so that really jazzes me. Um, very engaged people. Um, it, it, the youth of it, the energy of it, it really keeps people moving forward, which is great. Um, I also think that my experience really lends itself to um, a community like an organization like Ann Arbor. I mean, I'm, I'm drawn for two reasons. Uh, the community, because I think it's a really progressive community that wants a lot and, and sees well beyond the present and into the future and wants to take care of the future to the best of its abilities. And I also think there's great opportunity as an organization. High-performing organizations are really tough. But if you can make it a really healthy culture, you will achieve ever much more than you ever anticipated. So that jazzes me. Great. Thank you. Well, let's jump into our behavioral questions. Uh, what do you find is most effective to keep your direct reports motivated? And can you tell us about a time when you were very successful at that? Sure. Um, you know, so the direct reports, I think, especially at the director level, as an assistant city manager or manager um, level, it's what I have found, and I've learned this, as I've gotten older, I certainly didn't believe it when I was younger. I did it a little differently. But what I've learned is that to keep people motivated, they really need to understand where things are headed. They need to understand where their work fits in and have the room to do it. Um, I believe my job as an assistant city manager or as a manager is to support them and create an environment that allows them to take advantage of their professional expertise, their energy, and what they want to do professionally in a way that also meets the goals of the community and the in the council. Um, I find that um, everybody is different. Just like each one of you is different uh, from a communication perspective, what your desires and priorities are, it's the same thing for directors. So I've really got to understand what, how they like to communicate, what's important to them, and what they want to achieve professionally and personally. And I want to be able to support that. I also want to have a two-way communication with them. I want them to be able to hear from me what I think is going well. Um, what I think there's some opportunities and I want to do it regularly. I don't want to do it once a year during a performance review. I want them to do the same thing. I like to do 360s. I like to sit down with my direct reports and have them give me a 360 face-to-face. -face. Tell me what the strengths are, the opportunities are, and what they'd like to see me do different or better. I think one of the toughest motivational things within an organ a high-performing organization in a community like this is keeping them focused and feeling like they're supported. There's so many times where a community and a council in this type of environment can go popcorn, where there's so many things that pop up 
that the people and they're, you're chasing so many different things you don't feel like you're accomplishing anything. Um, and so that's really tough. And so that takes a real conversation with the council and the staff to figure out what the operating agreements are. What are your operating agreements? What are your expectations? Um, how do we create a work plan that supports your vision but in a way that allows everybody to do it in a time that satisfies you, satisfies the community, but also allows professionals to do what they do, um, to really support. I also think what's really important, one of the hardest things to keep people motivated is, is have them understand that when there's a policy decision to be made by a legislative body, the, it's our job to inform it. It is not our job to make it. Um, I think it's our job as professionals, and I think it, when you get to that point in your career and understand it, it can be really enriching to understand that it's so important to give a council, a legislative body, and a community context and background for issues, options, and a recommendation, and then let the policy discussion happen and help engage in it to a way that's productive that you reach a consensus that may not be your recommendation, which is okay, and may not even be any of the options that you put out there. Um, but understand that it's the community and the council that owns that, and you're a part of it. Um, that can be really challenging. That I have found to be the most challenging thing for directors and direct reports in a, in a community in a high-performing organization like this. Councilmember Crapel. Excuse me. You, you've highlighted a little bit your leadership philosophy, but could you expand it a little bit and then how you translate that into actually coaching and developing uh, the employees, not only your direct reports, but also the other employees that work within the organization? Sure. Um, so my leadership philosophy um, is really essentially that I think everybody is a leader from where they sit or stand. I don't think it's a title. Um, I think that everybody in the organization is a leader, and I want to empower everybody within the organization within a framework. Um, I, I like to have, I'm wired, I'm trained like an attorney. I'm trained as an attorney, not like an attorney. I'm trained as an attorney, and I, I'm wired like that. So I like to get in a room and hear 360 degrees of an issue. If you get into a room and just want everybody to tell you what you're thinking or what you're believing, you're going to miss something, you're going to miss making uh, the best of an issue or an item. So I really like a collaborative innovation, in, a, a collaborative innovative uh, environment. Um, I think it's really, the days of command and control within local government is over, I believe, and I think it's actually a good thing. We have multi-generations in the workplace, probably greater than ever before, so there's so many different work styles. So as a leader, you have to figure out how to mesh all of those work styles together, because there is no real wrong work style. Everybody does something different and hears something different, so you've got to find a common ground. So I work really hard at that, but also giving framework. I think that you can't just have an open, frameless, uh, arena in which to have a, a discussions and conversations it, with. I want people to feel really free um, to come up with ideas, but it, some, usually you have to have boundaries. Um, and then you just keep on narrowing as you move along as to what the, the, the options and the recommendation are. Um, I think conversations and dialogue are critical as a part of leadership. Um, I think asking the right questions. I, th I think providing a vision organizationally is really critical. Um, there's, I believe there needs to be a vision organizationally, and I think there needs to be a vision at the council and community level, and those need to align. Um, and I'm sorry, though. I How do you translate that, actually? Oh, into code. Yeah. So, so everybody's different. And what I have found is um, the way that, you know, there's, it's, it's like friends or family or, or di everybody's different. Everybody has a different way of wanting to hear things or say things. So, so what I try to do is I try to get to know uh, how they're wired and how they hear things and how they need to hear things or be heard or how they communicate. And then I work within that to under, because if I communicate in a way that we're talking against each other, they're not going <coughs> to understand what I'm saying constructively or not. Um, so I really try to engage in a one-on-one -on -one conversation and create relationships so that there's a trust um, that, that I'm going to tell, because I'm, I'm from the Northeast, I'm pretty direct and I usually like to tell uh, what I think I see. Um, and tell my truth, um, and then have a conversation about it. And I want to have a, the person do the same thing to me. I, do, I believe it's important that um, there's coaching on a regular basis, constructively. It's, co coaching's not a bad thing. The, de the, the days where you were told you had a coach, you were like ready to pack your bags. Um, I actually think that coaching is an outstanding thing, and we all need it. I, 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 want, I want to get coached by the people that I work with and work for. I want to coach the people that I, I want to make them the best they can be. Um, and that takes some hard conversations sometimes. Councilmember member Warpahowski. Uh, thank you. You've given us a lot of um, philosophy about how you try to approach your leadership and working with your direct, support, direct reports. I'm wondering, and you, 
issues of how to manage the pop potential popcorn it, uh, nature of governance, the desire to have multiple people as leaders, but also needing to provide a bounding um, framework or vision. Can you give us some examples of how that actually works out on a day-to-day -day basis in your leadership, either at Boulder or Asheville? Sure. So uh, one of the techniques that we created in Boulder while I was there and have applied it successfully in Boulder and in Asheville is um, uh, doing the annual visioning and work plan process. And so um, what we do is every year or two years, ideally, uh, we meet with council and we, we have them create what their vision is. Um, and it, there's different ways to do it. One of, the, one of the ways that we most recently did in Nashville is instead of just looking at your three-year term, we ask you to look 20 years forward. And we ask you to look at what do you want um, Ann Arbor to look like in the year 2036. Because that helps you put into context the long term and, and to put in context the short term and what's important for you. And then what we do is we work to create uh, within your vision, and, and there's usually six or seven uh, areas that, that you want to focus on, which can be challenging, um, but you, you identify the areas you want to focus on, you identify what your vision is for that 2036, and then we as a staff go back to develop for you a work plan that includes a time frame and performance measurements that will tell you when that is going to come to you and what that looks like. And then we present it back to you, usually within a month or two of your retreat, to have you look at it and say, eh, this, is, this is too far off, this is too fast, are you sure you have the resources to do it? And we will identify for you if we do not believe we have the resources to do it. Um, because there's, it's easy to say, this is our vision, this is our goal, go do it. But usually there's some resources, whether internally or you need to reshape things. So then what we do on a regular basis is we, what I think is ideal, is provide the um, updated work plan in every agenda packet you have. Um, so that every, uh, every t if you have an issue or a question about when something's going to come before you or what, what's coming before you, um, you, we can then have the conversation. If someone has an issue that they want to address that's not on the work plan, we can say, look, we do not have capacity to do that, but if we can create options for you that if you want to move down this path and you can get a nod of a certain number, um, then we will do that, but we will identify for you what has to come off the plate, what has to get deferred, or if you want to move on it quicker, what resources we have to add. So it's a really great conversation to have, and it, keeps, it helps manage some of the issues that pop up, which naturally happen in any community, um, and, it, it, and it helps staff really manage its workload. Um, because most staffs in high-performing organizations want to achieve and please the community and the council. But sometimes they take on too much, so the work plan I find is very effective at doing that. I've done it successfully so far in both Asheville and Ann Arbor. Oh, no. <laughs> Asheville, <laughs> Asheville have too many A's. Asheville and Boulder. Um, and I'm trying to think, I think that's, the, that's, I have found it to be very successful. It's not always easy. Um, councils sometimes are very reluctant to do it, but then they really sometimes get really jazzed by the vision process because it's so easy to look at your three-year term, four-year term, um, two-year term and identify what you want to do in the moment, but it doesn't really provide long-term because, as you know, some of, the, some of the initiatives that you take on, you can't unwind in a year or less. Councilmember Grant. Actually, as a quick follow-up to that. I think you, you mostly answered it, um, but we... Oh, sorry, now I have my mic on. I apologize. Uh, we have run into uh, issues where, you know, we've been presented with, okay, these are the trade-offs, and then the council just says, well, you know, do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So could you give an example of how you've used the work plan potentially or just a situation where you've had to manage that um, conflict and, and use the tool successfully or um, when it hasn't worked successfully and, and what you did in response? Sure. Um, it's not always successful um, because councils and communities are pretty hungry. Uh, and sometimes staff is too because staff wants to put things on because it's so this is just the council work plan staff has a work plan outside of that because they have to perform their regular duties in addition to achieve council priorities so it's it's two work plans it's the council work plan and then it's the staff work plan um, so, uh, so what I have I'll take the successful first what I have seen is um, in Boulder um, it's a really high expectation community in, in council um, very engaged, great people, uh, forward thinking, um, but they're hungry. Um, and they've become so hungry in certain areas that it was really hard. And that's actually why we instituted the work plan. We started instituting. They were pretty resistant in the beginning. But then what we found is council members were keeping each other. It wasn't even staff that had to do it. It was council members were saying, hey, 
we can't, we don't have the resources to do this, and if we do this, we're going to defer this. And actually, what I think, in the, you know, during while I was there, but even after I left, what I think has happened is that the council has become so concerned that when you take on so much in a community, um, you know, affordable housing, you name it, sustainability, transportation, you can really um, shake the snow globe to the to a major degree in the community. If you have too many big issues popping at once, you're not you're going to have a really shaken snow globe community, and that that may not necessarily get you progress. And I think Boulder started realizing that that yeah, it's great to have all of these objectives, but if you have too many things going on at once, whether it's work uh, workload related or it's there's only so many things you can pick off at once in a community before you put them at saturation. Um, and then unsuccessful, sure. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of a specific one, but councils are like that all the time. And it's like, you know, I have that in Asheville too, because Asheville were just starting the work plan, the visioning, and they, they're, they're struggling with it. Um, but they went through the process, and this is the first term we're doing it. Um, uh, I'm trying to think that for a specific example, but it happens all the time. But I have to tell you, I, have, I think what my job is that I have to tell you and be very frank with you about, look, if you want to, because I'm not, gonna, I'm not the type of person that I'm just going to try to snow anybody and, and tell you something just to get to a certain end. I'm going to tell you what you need to be, to be, what I think you need to be to be successful from the organizational perspective. Um, so, so I tend to be, I would be very frank with you and, you know, ultimately it's your call, but I will identify for you what I think the impacts are going to be if you mo are moving forward too fast, not on the policy issue, but on whether or not we can sustain that in the organization. Because what I have found in high performance organizations is you can choose to be an employer of choice or you can choose to be a churn and burn organization. Because when you are churning so much internally and externally, it will churn and burn staff. And you, you, you could see people leave and good people leave because of that, because they can't sustain it. Um, so it's having those honest conversations um, about it. I, I can't think of a specific example, but it happens all the time. And there are times where, you know what, staff does have to figure out ways to get things done. And maybe it's a negotiation where maybe it's not so fast. Um, and maybe we negotiate on the, on the timing of it. Um, but what I, what I don't want staff to do is be an obstacle to council, nor do I want the council to be an obstacle to the organizational health, because it's, it's, it will hurt each other. Councilman DeLong. Thank you. Uh, follow on to the leadership and visioning and goal setting line of questioning. Um, you mentioned the Boulder 2020 initiative in your written responses. Can you please describe what that was, uh, what your role was in the initiative, and what specific changes resulted from the initiative? Sure. So actually, that was the brainchild of the city manager, uh, and she, she, Jane Brodigan, and she and I worked together, and she put together a team. So what the Boulder 2020 was, it's um, in Boulder's, Boulder, actually, it's a high, it's very reliant on sales tax, which has beauties to it, uh, but also detriments. So when the economy really tanks, the, the sales tax, you really have to, like, be nimble and adjust your budget immediately. Um, but so what we did is we had a number of um, infrastructure issues and other, other initiatives that we had not enough money for. Um, but a great need for, and so, and we had we had divergent uh, populations within the community and the organization. So the way Boulder is funded, Boulder has dedicated sales taxes, which creates sometimes a have and have not. Um, like open space transportation, they have dedicated sales tax, so they tend to get uh, pumped in with a lot of money. General fund operations necessarily do not have that; they they get what's left over, um, so they struggle a little bit more. And in, in, in Boulder, there's also something called TAPE, called TAPE or the, the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, which maximizes how much you can increase your taxes. But you can go to the ballot and detaborize, um, get the voters to approve detaborizing your sales tax so you can get more. But so what we did is because, because when Jane came in and Jane, um, there was, there was a, and Jane and I came in within six months of each other, um, there was a real need for a focused, strategic look at how we meet the long-term needs of the infrastructure and the organization. Because there were so many things that the community wanted to council, uh, and the community and the council wanted to achieve. And so, instead of having pockets of each group come to council and 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 do their thing individually, what we did is we put together a stakeholders group um, from the uh, from externally. And it was the ma city manager put together a stakeholders group. It was from most boards and commissions uh, across the city. And there's some also interested stakeholders in the city. And what we did is we, then, we presented to them at a staff level what we believe the needs and the priorities were 
both from an infrastructure perspective but also from a programming perspective. And then what we did is we had a really public process to identify, to have that group really talk. So we had departments go before it and, and um, identify for it, uh, give them, uh, because Boulder is great at giving background, giving options, giving recommendations, and then let the conversation happen. And so that's what happened. The departments went before that body, provided them with information on what the priorities were and what the needs were, and then let them have a conversation about what they would recommend to council to go to ballot to get funding for. And it worked excellent. This, um, right, I think right before I left, the voters passed a huge initiative that put funding into the, um, what we call the civic area plan, where the, if you've been downtown in Boulder, uh, the government owns most of the property right by the creek in the downtown area, and it's got its campus there, it's got the library there. But it's also got significant transient um, and behavioral issues there. And we could not figure out how to do it, but we needed to do public space management, and we needed to do public art, and we needed to get people re-engaged in that area and not be afraid of that area. And so that's just one of the samples, uh, uh, examples of what was funded through that ballot initiative. Because, uh, and we, I forget what we called it, because every, every project that we had, we put a sign out there to let the voters know this project is being funded by this ballot. Because when you educate voters in a community, a progressive community, they will support tax increases. They will support tax increases, and <laughs> Boulder was awesome at it. They were not afraid of taxing themselves for what they thought were their priorities and their values. I mean, it was, so, so the, my, and my role was to support that. I mean, Jane was the lead for that, but I supported that through the departments that um, I, I support on a regular basis. Um, but there's also the, the other thing that Boulder, and Boulder has done this is historically. It was based on a model called the Blue Ribbon Commission, and we did the Blue Ribbon Commission one and two. I was not there for the first Blue Ribbon Commission, but the first Blue Ribbon Commission was about the revenue side. Because of the, you know, and I think everybody does, is doing it these days, especially the more progressive communities, you're doing a long-term projection about your gap between your revenues and your expenses and how much bigger it gets as you go along. And they had strategies about how to attack that and make it lesser and hopefully get rid of it. And then they brought it to the voters, and the voters continued to approve those strategies. The second part, which I was there for, was to do the same thing, put together a stakeholders group on the expenditure side. And so we had the same thing. We had departments go before this body, this citizen body that was appointed by the city manager. And we had the departments present about expenditures, and they asked tons of questions, and they came up with different options and proposals, and they produced their own report about what, we thought, what they thought they, we needed to do on the expenditure side moving forward. Um, and that's part of how we got to priority-based budgeting. But so that, that, mod that's how, that model was what helped support the next step. The community is very supportive of that type of process. Councilmember Warfahowski. Uh, this is, uh, Paul, if I could just, as you're going forward, one thing that's going to really help me is if you can give me some more clarity on to what your role, what you described in Boulder sounds fantastic, and I don't know what your unique contributions were to that process. It sounds like a great process, but I don't sure. know where you are in that. Sure. And so as you go forward, you help me understand what you're bringing, what you've brought, sp you specifically have brought to the initiatives at your organizations and what you'd be bringing to the city of Ann Arbor. Sure, and I'll be happy to address that a little bit right now. So Boulder, so every organization is different. And so in Boulder, the deputy city manager under the previous city manager by whom I was hired, under whom I was hired, was very much wanted the two deputies to be focused on the operations and basically run the operations while he would focus on the external and the council. Um, when, when Jane came in, uh, uh, she started her tenure six months after I got there. She um, changed that structure where she wanted the, the deputy retired and she and I split the functions, but she, I became much more of an internal support and Boulder's so high performing, so what the deputy city manager role was really to be the sounding board and the strategist and the person that would, not to be the front person, uh, but to be the strategist behind the scenes to help run through all of these scenarios. So the deputy during my tenure didn't lead many things, but was a significant strategist about how to handle and how to support because it, 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 part of the beauty of Boulder is that the, the people are so professional and do such a great job that they are, you, they are on it before you even have to ask them about it. Um, and so my role is, was significantly to do the strategy behind the scenes and to talk to the, to run through all the scenarios ahead of time. Um, and just specifically the Blue Ribbon Commission too, I chaired that group, um, which was interesting because it was a citizen body, but we just, the manager decided that she wanted to have a staff member ch chair it. Um, 
so that there is, because there is dedicated tax groups, is dedicated versus undedicated. De- dedicated. People did, some people don't want dedicated taxes, some people do. Um, so we had, I chaired the commission for that one, um, which was tricky and interesting. But again, my role, in international, my role is a little bit different too. I'm very much on the um, supportive operational side where I'm the strategist, go-to person about how we're going to get things done. Depending on the issue, I'll be the, uh, the front person on the outside, but it depends largely on the issue. But I will try to address that more specifically. Councilmember Tyler Um I've asked this question before, and I'm going to ask you again, too. Uh, how do you make sure that all voices are heard? And the context is you tend to hear from people who are articulate and more educated and who, are, who believe in participatory democracy, who turn up for city council meetings and fill out all the surveys. Uh, what is your vision on that? Do you, uh, because a lot of times here too, we make sure that there is community engagement in projects. So incorporating multiple voice and multiple visions at the very beginning of the process seems to be, seems to help because when people, groups of people feel that their positions or views are excluded, then later on in the process tend to oppose it and it becomes very vitriolic. So. How do you handle that? Or how have you handled that? Or how do you plan to handle that? Sure. Uh, so I think it depends on the issue. Um, ideally, when there's time, I would prefer to have the council open mic type environment not be the last point as opposed to the first point. Um, because when you have an open mic council environment, that's where you get the, the one directional, one point of view, as opposed to if you have time to you know, say you're doing a planning process. I mean. Uh, I'm trying to think through when we had some real budget problems in 2008, 2009, what we did was instead of wait till we got to the point where we had a recommended budget, you put together forums with facilitators um, that I work closely with with the finance department where we developed a system and in, in the engagement process you can do it across any issue is you, you, you can create environments where it's not open mic because people can be intimidated by open mic. Some people are not comfortable going into a room and just standing up at a mic and telling you what they think, especially if the crowd is pretty much leaning towards one side. That can be really challenging. Um, and so there, what, what, we have, what I've tended to do, especially in difficult issues, and, and, and actually not even just difficult issues, I just think it's a way to engage these days, is to create open house forums where it's not like a city council meeting. I mean, council certainly there to to work the room and to be in the environment and to talk is but you set up an open house forum where you have different stations depending on the issue where people go go speak to staff one-on-one um, and then what typically one of the scenarios that we have done in the past is we've done it on budget we've done it in some of the open space issues is that you create depending on the station you either create a wall behind each station where people can write their concerns ideas or questions or thoughts on a post it and put it on the wall Because then, depending, either we will collect that information and combine it and make it public as we continue the conversation, or and or we will have a facilitator at the end of that have a conversation about all of the things on the wall and go through each of those issues. So there's some really great facilitation techniques out there. Um, I also think that you know one of the things that ICMA is struggling with is the days of having the council meeting be the best way to make decisions are gone. But that's still the way we're structured. Um, because people are looking for so many different avenues to provide input and ideas that we've got to figure out the best ways to do it. Because, you know, at the public meet and greet the other night, it was pretty clear there are some people who have no interest in social media and don't want to engage that way. They want to engage in the meeting, which is fine. But then you have people who are saying, I want to engage mostly through social media. Um, so it's really figuring out the I- whatever the issue is um, and trying to come up with a game plan about the best way to engage. Um, it can depend on the issue. Sometimes you have to go through an open mic um, because sometimes based on the issue, either you don't have the time to plan for it, which is fine, um, and, and sometimes you just need it as a release. The community needs to be heard through an open mic process. Thank you. Please tell us about your most problematic employee. Uh, were there issues performance-based or behavioral attitudinal, and how did you handle the situation? What was the outcome? That's a tough one to answer publicly. Um, So, I'm sorry, I'm taking some time to think about how I can answer this with maintaining privacy and confidentiality. Um, So one one of my most problematic employees um, 
it, it was has been through management style and leadership. Um, there was a situation where the department had numerous functions under it, and, and there were some leadership changes um, that impacted the workload of this person, so it had more workload going to this person on, on two connected but kind of disparate functions. Um, very, it was a, a, an individual who had been in the organization for, by the time I had gotten there, probably about 15 years. Um, very good at what they do, an expert in their field. Um, but their style had, had not grown with the generational changes, and so the command and control had not been working. And it was not working well at all. It was not, not open to feedback. The individual was not open to feedback at all and actually was pr created a pretty hostile environment, work environment for the employees. But when we would have conversations, it'd be a really, you know, I'd try, because people would, you would hear these things, and you, you'd try to, I'd try to have a conversation with the individual, um, and I would get a totally different viewpoint um, and say that there was a reason. There was some reason. There was always a reason. Um, and so I tried to uh, try to coach the individual. And when you are a, a number two person, you're in a tricky spot. You have a lot of responsibility, but not tons of authority. You can't hire and fire technically, usually as a deputy or an assistant. So you're in a little bit of a weird spot. Um, but so I, I took the approach of having very frank conversations with the individual um, on a regular basis, trying to work through even just through issues, because even the, the presentations at council, and there are significant presentations, you could tell they fell like they they would just it would land like a thud because the staff was so scared up at that dais of making a mistake because of the way that person was managing the presentations were horrible the presentations were horrible the staff was not engaged they weren't energized and the council was just what's going on um, so we worked through a lot of that we you know <laughs> in Boulder we used to have the pre pre agenda setting we had the pre agenda and then we have the agenda. We would go through an agenda three times um, before it actually landed to the council, and it, they're typically over 500 pages. But um, so we worked really hard at doing, uh, working hard on the staff reports uh, with this department. We worked really hard. We had dry runs, which I find very effective. We had dry runs to really talk through how you're going to present this, how it comes across. We would do questions and answers. Uh, still had problems. Um, and so it got to the point where we uh, st shifted to doing 360-degree reviews. And that's where we were able to get some trust within the individuals in the department who would come forward and actually talk about what was going on. And so then based on that feedback, what we did is we hired a facilitator um, to do an organizational, to do two things, to work with the, um, with the department and the department head to uh, talk about the organizational, the departmental culture. But then we also did an organizational assessment, a departmental assessment, to see what was going on and if, was it structured right or not right. And so based on those outcomes, we identified that um, we needed to take swift action. Um, we had some very frank conversations with the, with the individual. We set them up for some really intensive training. Um, we made some organizational changes. Um, we put the person on a what you call a performance improvement plan, a PIP. Um, and it was a struggle. Uh, the person was very opposed to it, um, very hurt by it. Um, but we made it very clear that we will set the table for your success, and ultimately it's up to you whether you're successful. Um, and we, she was successful. Council Member Crackle. Yeah, you, you, in the same line, conflict is normal be within any organization between departments or different management groups and things. And sometimes those can stem from personality conflicts among different managers or between different managers. How, how do you handle conflicts within the organization between two opposing departments? And also, how would you manage uh, conflicts between uh, senior level managers? And if you have an example um, of how you've done in the past, please provide it. Sure. Um, so conflict, I try to, I try to manage, proactively manage it so that people, because of course there's different styles, there's different personalities in the workplace. So what I have found effective in management teams is to really do some personality type, work style type training so that people really understand how people are wired. Um, there's many tools to do it. There's the Berkman, there's the Myers-Briggs, there's the DISC, you name it. There's tons of ways to do it. So, there's, so you have a language to be able to identify like, oh, you're not just a person I don't like. You're wired this way, and you need to hear things or do things this way. That's why you're coming across this way to me. I find it really effective. It can be painful a little bit at first, but actually management teams can have some fun with it. 
Um, so, there, so there's a framework. I try to create a framework where you can have a conversation about personality and work style differences ahead of time. Um, so sometimes it can make the conflicts a little bit easier and more about the issue as opposed to the person. Um, so a specific example, there is, again, to be really, try to be, uh, maintain confidentiality and privacy, but so there's, there's a, there was a, um, you can imagine in, in communities and organizations like this that no one department controls everything. In most departments, an issue encompasses much more than one department. One department may be a primary, but it takes a team to achieve all this. Um, and so there was, there were some situations where, one specific situation where we were trying to put on an event that um, through some property, which was a very powerful department and entity within the community, which basically challenged us and said as an organization, because there were five, I mean, we had public safety, you name it. We had public safety, we had transportation, we had the city manager's office, we had a, a, an executive team of, um, of a, a number of department heads working on this issue to make it successful. And we had one department stand out and say, you're not doing this because you're going to violate this or that. Um, and so what we did was we, and in response, that's why we created the executive team, because what we had found happening was that there was so much dialogue happening out among the departments and so much friction out in the departments because they were looking at it from their own perspective, the heads down with their own perspective for the department as opposed to looking at the bigger event and how we achieve it as a community. And so what we did was in response to that, we created an executive team where we empowered the mid-managers to be the go-to team, the regular team that was going to be the ones to put, because they're the ones who are going to put together the type of event anyhow and make it successful. Um, and it was a major international event, um, first time it was coming to the community. And so there's a lot of pressure to do it and do it well, and there's a lot of questions about whether it was economically feasible or not or beneficial. And so we put together an, an executive team where it was led by the city manager's office where we made sure that instead of the, the directors getting deep into the conflicts, we let the mid-managers work the day-to-day. -day. And then on a, on a monthly basis, we met with the directors where we said, okay, as, a, as the mid-managers, we had a project lead. You bring the issues and you bring the updates to us as an executive team. We'll talk about it as a group because that's where we're going to resolve the conflicts. We're not going to resolve the conflicts or the different views um, if it can't be resolved at the mid-manager level, we're going to bring it up through the executive team level so we have it as a team, uh, and so we help provide perspective. It worked really well. Uh, there were still conflicts, which was fine, uh, but we ended up having, and very challenging for a number of reasons, because when you cross certain properties in, in, in Boulder, people are going to challenge certain things. Um, but it worked really well. Councilor Murray Eaton. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I was glad to see that you have experience in um, collective bargaining. Do you currently have uh, collective bargaining units in Asheville? No. So uh, North Carolina is a right-to-work state, so there are no government uh, – unions at the government level are not legal. However, what that results in is there are associations, which are very politically powerful. But in your previous experience, you've had collective bargaining. Yes. Every other – So discuss with – me, um, or just describe to me how you encourage or foster trust between unions and an employer. Sure. Um, I try to not do it at, through just contract negotiations. Contract negotiations are not the, to not the time or the place to really bolster employer relations. It's certainly a way to do it, but it's not the time to do it. Um, so it depends on the jurisdiction. Um, but what, I, what my preference is, is to create a relationship and, and really focus on employee relations so that when it gets to contract negotiations, there's a relationship and an understanding of what the issues are. Um, and, and I've done both traditional bargaining and I've done interest-based bargaining. I think that when you get to economic issues, you probably can't do anything but traditional bargaining. But interest-based bargaining can be quite interesting where you focus on common interests and that really helps the dialogue as opposed to positional, I want this, you want this, and we're never going to see eye to eye. Um, but that's at the table. I think what's the, quite honestly, the contract negotiation, it's like buying a house. Executing the contract is probably the easiest part. Making the contract be successful and make it a, a successful employee relationship is the hardest part um, because the contract tells you how you're going to pay, how you're going to provide benefits, how you're going to work certain grievances, uh, but it doesn't, it, it contributes to the um, environment, the work culture. 
but the ongoing employer relations is what you really have to work on because then that will help influence your contract negotiations, will, which will not always ever be easy. Um, but it'll help influence the relationship so that it's more dialogue and conversation along the way so that you understand where each other's coming from. So just so I understand, you say you've done both um, traditional and interest-based. Correct. Um, it sounded like you prefer or, or default to, to traditional bargaining? No, no. So, uh, you know, having gone through both, um, what I have found is no matter how hard you try to do interest-based, when it comes down to the financial and economic issues, it's pretty hard to sit there and say, you know, I have the interest that I want to get the best paying, because essentially you would frame it as though my interest is that I want to make sure that my employees are the are in the top three paid. And then uh, on the city side, you want to say that I want to make sure it's competitive and market-based and all that. In the end, it's going to be, I want 3%, I want 5%. So, so what I have found, because what we had done in Boulder was we used the federal facilitators, mediators, which was a great service to help us. And it wasn't, we did it from the beginning to interest base. They're really good at interest base. Um, that we, we kept on finding that when we got down to the economics, that it, we would have to switch into traditional because it's so hard to do interest based on the economic conditions. So no, I don't have a preference. I actually think it depends on the relationship and the issue. Thank you. Councilmember Westfall. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed hearing uh, what you've been saying about employee cultivation and, and management. Uh, there's a challenge uh, in this region as, as perhaps in, in at least uh, perhaps Asheville with regard to attracting a talent to the organization. Um, is there are, are there any techniques that came up in Asheville or Boulder that worked or didn't work, and did you need to change them to make sure you have the best and brightest working in your organization? It's a great question. Um, it is a challenge. It's been a challenge in, in, the, in both places that I've worked in the past eight years. Um, Asheville is a challenge because Asheville is the the biggest metropolitan area with for a span of an hour and a half on every side, so there's not a great labor pool. So we'll, in Asheville, what our strategy has been, and, and I, I, I kind of took it from, from Boulder, is that when you work in environments and communities like this, to get the best and the brightest, you have to make sure that you have a work environment where people feel supported and that they can really do cool things that the council wants, that the community wants, and they have the room to do it. It's really important to be able to have a reputation that you're a high-performance organization, but a healthy one as well. Um, and so organizational development is something that I think is key because inside, because you want to grow the people internally, but you also want to create an environment that uh, is pretty much a magnet for people across the country, either people internally who want to grow into positions for succession planning or externally bring in national talent. But what I have found most successful to get the best and the brightest, either internally or externally, is you do some great things as an organization. The, your best advertising is to be a part of the national scene of your associations and to go out and present and help other communities understand what you're doing and how they can do it. Because that is the best, I have seen, the best, because then what you'll do is you'll start getting national recognition and awards, which will be seen by all the associations where the, the best and the brightest in the field will be looking at, they'll be at those conferences. And so you'll create an energy where people want to go to work for that place. Um, I also think it's really important to engage in national recruitments, whether you're going to hire locally or not. If you do national recruitments, just putting your profile out there and about the position, about the environment and the community, it will attract attention. And it, and it takes some time for people to say, hey, you know, stuff is happening here in Arbor. But if you commit to that and you stick to it, because that's one of the things that I saw um, learned from my, pre my, my city manager in, in Boulder was that when she got there, she was so committed to, and I didn't understand it at first, she felt that she was so strongly committed to the fact that Boulder has to play at the national level, at the association professional level. Because if, you, if you're not, one, sometimes your community and your council don't recognize the real work and how good the work is that you're doing on a national scene. So it brings, it brings a perspective locally, but it also gets you national talent and a reputation where people are going to really want to work for you. Councilman Lum, Kalisopathy, Ackerman. Thank you. In any organization, there are departments with high-performing teams and departments with not so high-performing teams. Can you please describe how, in your present uh, position, you've dealt with that, and uh, from making the initial assessment uh, to affecting changes that worked and and what and didn't work? Sure, it's a um, 
It is. So in my current position, um, as I've said, you know, Asheville is a community of 84,000, and it has about 9 million people going through it each year. It is, it's a great thing. Um, but it's also, so the community has popped in the culture has popped faster than the organization has been able to keep up with it. Um, so it's been a real challenge to figure out how do we get the organization into a high-performing um, organization so that we can not only meet the needs, the existing needs, but anticipate and go even beyond that. Real challenge. There are some high-performing departments, um, but there's also some departments that struggle, and I'm not going to be specific about which ones, but what I have found, you know, it really depends on the situation. I have one situation right now um, where, so Asheville, as, as Boulder and Ann Arbor have, is they have pockets of people that want certain things and there's popcorn all over the place. So, so the department has gotten so confused to the point where they've given up um, that because they're, they, 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 you know, they go down this path and then they're told to go down this path and so it's very confusing for them. So what we've tried to work on doing is doing a vision for that department and through the master plan, I think master plans are critically important uh, because it gives context. It gives context to the boards and the commissions. Um, so this department, we're working on trying to update their master plan and what I have found in Asheville is that they do master planning but it's not a part of the vernacular. So when decisions are being made, they're not referencing, the, neither the department nor the council are referencing, or the community are referencing the master plans. So that, in my view, means that the master plans really aren't part of the vernacular of the culture, and so how do we make the, the master plan more part of the culture? Um, the other thing that we've done is if, I, what I like to do is find utility players within the organization, and so if I've got a department that's struggling in certain areas, whether it's a staff report financially or um, uh, presentation-wise to the council, I will find a utility player within the organization who can do that and give them the opportunity to come in and help work with that department to, to do the best that they can do and help translate some of that experience into that department, but also give that utility player some experience themselves outside of their own purview. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of that. Um, we've done a lot. We just had a major issue that had to go before council, and I put together a team to bolster that department. And there's a, there's a hazard that I saw in that is that when you have departments or people that are struggling, there's at least one of two paths you can take. You can either take over and do it for them, or you can provide them the resources and hope that they can do the best and enable them to do the best, but be willing to let them do what they're going to do. And in this situation, because we had this conversation, I had this conversation about a week ago or so, saying, so, you know, I'm not sure it's there. I've done everything we can. The team has done everything we can. Should we just take over and do this for them? And we decided no, because if we take over and do it for them, then they're not going to grow as much as they can because they're then going to expect every time something happens that someone's going to come in and do it for them. Uh, so that's a, without being specific about the department, that's, that's what I've done recently. Councilmember Kalisopathy. Yeah. Uh, you, not the previous question, but the one before. You had mentioned how to be a magnet city so people would want to come in when you're hiring. Uh, that's great because you do want fresh ideas and fresh uh, new people coming in. Uh, but I also believe it's also important to have a balance between internally, um, I mean, succession planning. I mean, when a manager, so you retain uh, institutional memory and uh, all the things that go with good governance. Um, so h how have you, can you give examples from how you have <coughs> addressed the issue of succession planning so that uh, when managers leave, the department is not left in the lurch? And this is very relevant for us sure. right now. So sure, actually, so just to clarify, so I, I didn't, my intention was not to mean that it was either or. I actually think when you play at the national level, you create a, an environment and excitement within internally for people. One, you get them excited that there's actually different ways to do things and then you give them the exposure to see different ways of doing things, especially when they engage at the national level if they're through their associations or presentations or whatever. So I actually think that grows your inside talent and your inside skills um, by, by, because that's sending existing staff to national trainings, national um, conferences to do presentations. There's a lot of great organizations like the Alliance for Innovation where they're looking for innovative communities to do presentations at their conferences so that other people can learn from it. Um, so, th so that's all geared towards the inside. I mean, it certainly has a, a, an outside benefit as well, but it grows your internal staff. It creates an excitement, and it also creates a learning opportunity. 
Um, again, I think that succession planning, I haven't seen an organization yet do it well. I think government struggles with succession planning because I think there's, there, I don't think there's a common understanding of what people mean by succession planning. I think employees sometimes hear succession planning and that means that I'm existing in the organization, I'm automatically going to get this job if I do this. I actually don't, it's not my view, my, my view of succession planning internally is I want to, I want to create an environment organizational development wise, which, which means internal training. I want to provide external training opportunities. And I want to be able to try to be able to create utility players where you grow as an individual through your career in the organization. And you are not, if you've got a parks and rec or planning background, that's not the only place that you can play, so to speak. You can go to HR, you can go to any department based on what the issue is and add there. Um, so I think it's really critical to provide those, t again, I haven't seen succession planning do, because it's hard, it's hard to do succession planning, but my, my view is that s you create an environment where my goal is to grow every person in the organization to be the best person, the best employee, best professional they can be, because ultimately that's going to benefit the community if they stay and continue to move through the organization, or if they decide that it's, the, it's best for them to go to another organization, because that's great too for the for us to grow people to have opportunities outside of Ann Arbor as well, uh, because that grows the reputation of the, the quality product that Ann Arbor is, is creating. Thank you. Councilmember Ackerman, and we have, uh, of our standard questions, we have about, I think, five or so remaining and a, a little under 20 minutes, so. I will be brief. Excellent. Um, so a lot of this conversation has revolved around um, internal organizational culture and, and structure. Um, but our most critical customers are external, the, the taxpayers. They are, they are the residents. Um, can you, framed in a specific example, talk a little bit about how, as a leader, you influence a culture of customer service, but also as a manager, systems you've implemented to improve it? Sure. Um, so part of, what we, part of what I've done is, I think, uh, values. Uh, the organizational values are really important. I think the process of putting together organizational values are important. Um, and so what, we've, what I've done and been a part of in other organizations is to make sure that we uh, identify values and continue to live those. I, uh, I make sure that we put those in the performance evaluations from the director level down. Um, I also make sure that we identify competencies. Uh, there's a, a tool out there called, and I, I know there's a different way to pronounce it, but I call it the Lominger, the Lominger competency tool. And so basically what it does is based on your position, you create competencies through which that person needs to, to meet and exceed. And then as you grow in the organization that you continuously, it's different competencies as you go up in different levels. Um, but we focus, and, and what I find, the hard, actually I find the easiest to be customer service externally um, because that's pretty easy. Uh, from the perspective of it's easy to relate that, that those, these are your customers. You're always, you always, it doesn't matter what the question is, uh, whether it's specific to your field or not, you need to always be on when it's somebody from, um, the taxpayer or the public doesn't matter if they're, uh, matter if they're a taxpayer or not. Um, that customer service is priority number one. And what we do typically is, and what I've tried to do and continue to do in Asheville is try to, every month we have a, a staff meeting in each department speak about the value and give examples of how it was done well and how it wasn't done well um, and about how we can do things differently. So you keep the conversation live. That's what I find really important. And when you get a good customer service example, you really reward it. And, and you elevate it and tell people about it. And the same thing for a, a challenge is you certainly don't put people in front of the spotlight when they've done a bad one, but you s try to encourage and talk about it. Um, but I think one of the toughest ones is also internal uh, customer service. That's a harder one. Um, I think citizen surveys are really important. Um, I think continuously getting feedback from the public is critical. Um, and I don't mean just the three-year surveys that the National uh, Center does. I think you need to do, always be open to feedback about how things are. Uh, there are times where staff is wrong, and you have to say when staff is wrong. And there's times when staff is right. You've got to stand up and say staff is right. Um, but it's always the way that you do it and the way that you engage with them. Um, so the specific example that I have is um, I have, I'm responsible for water, water resources, and water resources in, in our city takes, is, is the spot where you go pay all of your bills. And so what we do is we've come up with a customer service campaign internally about how long we're going to have customers wait on the phone, how long we're going to have people wait in line, and how quickly we're going to process things. Um, and we look at those on a monthly basis with that department to review where are our gaps, where are, our, uh, where are we doing really well, and how do we keep on taking it to the next level. Um, because what I have found with customer service is you, you never reach a plateau. You've got to always continue to improve. 
so we work really hard. I also think um, you know one of the things that we've done in Nashville is the, we have a city hall that's pretty much on top of a hill, and it's not ex it's like this. It's all you know you can only get there. There's no parking. There's no real parking, and so the Parks and Recreation Department, which is a really high contact one for the public, is on the fourth floor. Um, and so we're looking at moving it to the first floor. We want to make sure that we're getting, and we're getting, we're, we're moving people out into the field so that we're making sure that we get people closer to the public for those departments that have that contact. So those are just a few examples. Great. Let's talk about how you have enacted change. Can you give us an example where you saw an opportunity for change and you went ahead and made that change happen? Sure. I'll give you a really crazy one. Um, so it was a community that I, when, I, when I first started managing, there was a community that had not done public, uh, had not done capital investment, capital improvements uh, bond-wise for 30 years. Um, it was just that type of New England community. And it was, which was fine, but we had a police, we had a, the town hall was a former high school, which had no real significant, it can be converted into a town hall and board of education offices. Um, it had no, it had a police department in it, had no, no capital improvements and it was pretty much declining. Um, and there was no focus on it. And so when I got there, um, the police department was in the basement. We had mold issues. We had a lot of issues. And so um, what we did was um, I, I knew that I needed to bring attention to it in a way that was drew a lot of attention but also education. And so what I, what I did was I talked, because I met on a regular basis with the, with the mayor, the minority leader, and the majority leader. Uh, and so uh, what, what I told them was, and I did this, I said, I'm going to propose a plan, which, because we also had downtown redevelopment issues. There was a downtown that was pretty tired, had long-term property owners that had no incentive whatsoever, understandably, to make any improvements because they were making money off of it and they didn't want to invest any more in it. And so what, we, what I did was I put together a plan and told them I was going to do this, and I did it at a Chamber of Commerce meeting, annual meeting. I proposed that um, we move City Hall down into the Main Street, we buy property, we buy all this property to house a mixed-use town hall that had uh, retail on the first floor and we had the offices and the police department on the second floor and in the rear. And it would have taken, I mean, it would have been a large investment, but it would have done a few things at once. My intent was um, to draw attention to the issues that we had and that you can't just fix one problem. You, you can't look at one problem and fix them you, because you've got a number of them and how do you put them together and meet all of the needs. And so it was, uh, it created quite a stir in the community. There's a lot of conversation about it. Um, Board of Education wasn't happy at all because I hadn't proposed that they would move with us to town hall, um, the new town hall. Um, and, but what it did was we started doing tours of, of town hall for the, for the uh, council, the elected officials. And then um, we got it to the point where the, the, we put together a building committee uh, the council put together a building committee who then proposed a bond referendum for the first time in 30 years, uh, and it was for a police department. And it was pretty controversial. It uh, failed by like 0.2% um, because there was a lot of politics going back and forth about what it included and didn't include. And in Connecticut, and I'm sure probably in Michigan too, you you have to shut down at a certain point before the the vote where you can't say a thing in support of uh, or opposition, you can only be factual. And so that's where a lot of the craziness happened. And, but what happened was within the span of a year, less than a year, the council was so supportive of that project that they moved to ballot again, and it passed overwhelmingly. Um, and so that, that community now has a new police department, and at the same time, we came up with a plan to redevelop the downtown, which they're now in their final phase of redeveloping that downtown. Can you tell us about a situation where you felt you had a greater sense of urgency than those around you? <coughs> Jeez, every day. Um, <laughs> um, budget. I'll give you an example of budget. So in the city of Asheville, um, there's a budget process, and I, I take budget planning really seriously, and I'm not a financial person. I, I mean, that's just not my background, but I've been doing it for 23 years. Um, that the budget has never been used as a planning document. It's just, and I find that that's usually how you, that's how you achieve things and you identify what your goals are and how you're going to achieve them and the time frame in which you achieve them. And, and what I found when I first got there is that it's a process that's pretty much doesn't kick off until like March and it's due to the council in May. 
And so there is no real, and I believe these days, budgets are year-round processes. Um, I, I, my, I, was on I was on fire of the urgency that we need to do something um, to make it better, make it better for the departments, make it better for the council, make it better for the public. Um, and so what I have learned to do is try and meet people where they're at. Um, and so instead of saying you need to do this, this, and this, I created a process through which I put together a team, a budget team, to look at the way we're doing things. We brought in a consultant to look at our process and to propose to us well, how we can improve the process internally and externally. And so now we're in the process of implementing that. We're, I think we're in the second budget cycle. We're also trying to do priority-based budgeting at the same time, which is quite challenging. Um, but so I've, I have felt an urgency from the day I got there uh, about that. And it's getting better and better each year, and certainly not as quickly as, as I want it to. But what I have found is that this, the, the speed with which we're going right now is really helping maximize the amount of people that we bring on board, because it is really a different way of being than they're used to. Okay. We're driving through. All right. Uh, can you describe a situation where you felt you had not communicated well? How did you correct the situation, and what was the result? Um, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of how to, um, it's really challenging. Um, um, so, when you work in a high-performing organization, you can have real, what, I, what we actually started phrasing in Boulder was creative abrasions. Um, <laughs> there, there can be a lot of creative abrasions, both internally and externally. And so we were working with an issue that had to do with the, um, the downtown and the civic area, which we started calling the civic area. And there was a number of departments that were in on the, in on the mix. And so there was, um, there was in, in many of the meetings, we had a lot of creative abrasions. Um, and so sometimes it can get, you know, pretty energetic about how is the best way to achieve this, how is the best way to do this or that. Um, it was funny, the, um, the police chief and I at the time, he's, uh, he's retired since then, he, there, was, there was plenty of times where we would, we would have creative abrasions over the best ways to achieve it, um, how the police department's role in it, how they go about it. Um, what the solutions are, and he, uh, we really enjoyed each other, but we looked at things very differently. Um, and so there could be some real um, creative abrasions where you can sometimes feel as though that you, you say things in the moment um, that you really don't mean the way it comes across. So, th so there were, Mark and I always had conversations about, hey, you know, I would go to Mark if I felt as though that I had said something uh, that might have come across in a way that I didn't mean it more critically. Because I am a critical thinker. I'm wired to be a critical thinker. Um, and so I know sometimes I can come across in a way that I don't, I, I don't intend it. So with Mark, just as an example, what I would do with Mark is I'd follow up. We'd have conversations all the time about, because he would do the same thing, um, about what our intentions were and what we actually meant. And so I did that on a regular basis with Mark. Can you tell us about a time when you had to make a decision without having as much information as data or data as you would have liked? What was the situation and how did you feel about having to make that decision? Sure. Healthcare. Um, so there's a community that I've worked in that, um, that does, did not have a multi-year strategy for healthcare benefits and the impact, uh, how much it was costing the city and how much it was costing the employees. It had not made, it had not made, signif it had not made any changes to plan design really and no changes to premiums for the employee uh, in over four years. And so it came to the point where when we were looking at the budget that w I wanted one to come up with a strategy about how to uh, do that fairly and equitably, but also how to, um, how to make sure it was responsible to the taxpayers. And so we worked through the Human Resource Department and our uh, agent of record to come up with options and the Human Resource Department worked really hard um, to work with those uh, and to come up with options and recommendations. And so we met as a team to consider those options and the recommendations. And we, we weighed through all of them. And one of them was changing tiers where all employees with children were paying the same amount regardless of how many children there were. And so we wanted to make it a little bit more equitable. 
and, and make a differentiation between how many children you had. And, but what we did was, based on the information, we made one big jump. We didn't put in between, so we did employee plus, so I think it was like employee plus one child or two child, and then anything beyond that was family. And it had a significant impact on those who were family. I think it was about 140 people out of you know a, a, an employee pool of about 1,200, but it was a significant impact. Um, and so what we did was we worked to try and get uh, a, pack a compensation package and a healthcare package so that we, we m minimized how many people would be walking away, if at all, with a net loss after, uh, after the, their choice. And we also tried to, as you do with healthcare benefits, create options where if you want a richer plan, you're going to pay more, so you are put, but you're also creating a, a base plan where they're mi ma minimizing their risk as well, but it's more of you manage it yourself, the high deductible health savings plan. Um, so we moved forward, and, and I, I was a little cautious, and I'm, I, I tend to be a change agent, but I, I was cautious saying I'm not sure our, our culture is ready for this because we were making the decision in February and, and open enrollment is May, um, and there was an outcry. Um, and what we found was we, hadn't, we, we had not, in the, I did not know the information uh, that we had, that we had not looked at our, our comparators or competitors in the market, and they had different tiers. They had additional tiers that allowed people a different option instead of going straight to family. And so I wish I had had that information. Um, I wished we had looked at it differently, but what we did was as a team, we went back and we said, you know what, we're going to add a tier. Uh, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to try and make sure that we're um, moving it forward equitably for the residents, but also equitably for the employees. Uh, and on top of that, we have to have a multi-year plan that we communicate well ahead to the employees so that they know what their impacts are over the years. Okay, last one. Can you tell us some specific steps that you have taken to cultivate diversity and inclusion in your organization? That can be your current role or a past role. Internally? Yes. Sure. Um, so there's a, so in one of the communities I've worked in, we have um, an inclusion and diversity committee. Uh, made up of people across every department has to be represented it meets on a monthly basis and we talk about inclusion and diversity um, and, and in this community one of the most challenging ones was diversity of thought um, actually diversity of thought is probably one of the most challenging ones but so we worked um, we would sponsor different events all the time and we would t have frank conversations um, about how to maximize the culture and the diversity of the culture within the organization um, we did some survey tools, and some of the survey tools were fascinating to see, especially if they felt that it was uh, confidential, and it was. Um, it was fascinating to see some of the results about how people felt whether or not it was an inclusive organization. So what we would do is we would then, based on some of those results, um, identify targeted areas of, or events or training um, that, we would do, that we would do. And what we did was we used the management team as a as almost like a, I don't want to say guinea pig, but it was our test place. We would come up with training. One of the most uh, best trainings I saw us come up with internally was the economic diversity training about how economics, someone's economic status can really impact their access to opportunities and what the world looks like. And they came up with some really great training. We did training on, um, so, and that's where, so the inclusive and diversity, the inclusion and diversity committee is where we came up with a lot of the training that we did. And we made inclusion, we started making um, inclusion and diversity training a mandate for every employee of the organization each year. Um, and so we did some massive training. But it, that's one of the ways that I've been involved and I've been a member of the committee. W what I like about it is, and it's really a tricky one, you do not want the city manager's office to be the one that's pushing it because you really want it to be a groundswell, um, a grassroots type of effort um, and that people really feel engaged in it. We're at the time, so uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much. But as before, uh, we before I bang the, the gavel, is there anything, any, any final thoughts, anything you'd like to say? Uh, no, I just I really appreciate the opportunity. I think you've got a um, a great community, a progressive community. You've got a really talented, committed staff. It's really obvious to me through the process that I went yesterday. They are they're hungry to make a difference in the organization. They're hungry to make an, a difference in the community, and they're hungry to do it with the council. And I think that's really important. I wish you the best of luck in finding the person that does that for you. Um, I tend to be, uh, you know, the council member made a great point. I tend to, I'm, I'm, uh, I said it in a panel yesterday, I'm one of those flowers that doesn't need a lot of sunlight. I'm kind of one of those flowers that's more of a shade flower. So I don't tend to, there's no, I mean, I will certainly be an excellent leader. I have the capacity to do it. I have the desire to do it. I have the energy to do it. 
I do not have the desire. I can't do it as you're not going to have one person do it. You're going to do it as a team. So everything that I have done, I've been lucky enough to do it with a team. And yeah, am I important part of it? Yes, but I'm just a part of it. Um, and so I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And with that, we're all taking our break. <laughs>